So we might as well begin. Tim, did you have some thoughts about Easter? I sort of assigned that to you last night. So, well, yes, it's um, this is uh, this is always such a a monumental day for me, probably be because my my father was a pastor, so I grew up in the church, and in fact, my brother is the sixth generation of Methodist minister in our family, going back both sides of my parents' lineages. Um, and it's interesting to note that almost all Easter days in my whole life have been sunny. And today's no exception. I wish I could show you. Wow. I went up, I went out for a long walk this morning before sunrise. Um, and the, the world has a kind of uh, freshness that it hasn't had for many weeks for me. And I'm, uh, I, would, I would say that's because of my own internal mechanism, not because the world has changed, except that I think it's really remarkable that so many Easter mornings have been sunny in my lifetime and I'm 64 years old. I think it's really rather remarkable that, that many times there have been a string of cloudy days and then Easter comes and the sun is out. Um, that's just, I don't mean to personally claim synchronicity, but it sure seems like it's working for me. <laughs> um, but I think a lot about the, the parallels between the Christian faith and Jungian psychology. I think they are, they're very well uh, integrated in my, in my experience. And so this business of renewal and the, the dead coming to life is the whole reason for Easter in the Christian world and in the Jungian world is exactly what Jung talked about being becoming uh, reborn in the sense of uh, individuation, coming to terms with the dark part of your own character. One thing that, that I think about a lot at this time of year is the difference between the Catholic tradition and the Protestant tradition. And I think one of the reasons why Martin Luther was upset with the Catholic Church is that, that there was so much focus on the suffering. Uh, the, the central emblem of the Catholic tradition is the crucifix, the crucified body of Christ. And a lot of focus is, is given to the suffering of Jesus and by extension, God's sacrifice to humanity. God loved us so much that God sacrificed God's own son, trying to get us to realize that the, the depth of God's love and I agree with that, that that's one metaphor that works. But for me in particular, being an artist, metaphors uh, do not compete against each other. They enhance each other. And so it's really helpful for me to think about the, the Protestant tradition, which has a central emblem of the empty cross. And the empty cross is significant because it exemplifies the risen Christ. The fact that in spite of everything, in spite of death and unfairness of, of the outer world and the kind of grief that all of us are subject to in carrying our own crosses, still there is a rebirth that is astonishing and inexplicable. 
And you read the, uh, the accounts from the Bible of Mary going to the tomb and finding the tomb empty and the disciples not believing. And they, they see Christ walking along the road and Thomas says, well, I don't, I don't believe you unless I can put my fingers in your wound. Um, these are, are metaphorical stories that for me are helpful in describing the feeling that after all, after all of the grief and the torment that we experience in life, there is a resurrection, a kind of coming to life that is absolutely inexplicable. It's very much like a person that was dead all of a sudden comes back to life and is walking around. As we say in the Jungian world, a psychic fact is still a fact, even though it's invisible. The, uh, the love that you have for your spouse or your children is a fact. It exists in the world and it has an, it has an impact on you. And healing is full of this. Uh, healing is centered around this black box, this mystery. We do not know how people heal. We know that, that placebo is a real effect. This is a psychic fact that people get better when they're given sugar pills or when, they're, when somebody waves a, a feather over them or blesses them. People actually get better. <laughs> this is a, a reality of our existence. And being very scientific and literal people, it's hard for us to believe anything we can't see. So how do you make sense of a fact, of a psychic fact? And one way is through metaphor. And for me, the metaphor of the risen Christ is really, really powerful because I recognize that Christ is, is walking around, that I look into the eyes of people around me and I see the, the eyes of Christ. I look at the beggar child and see that this is the angel of God who deserves my deepest love. And so for me, Easter is a reminder of the cyclic nature of the rejuvenation process that happens for each of us in a different way. And for me, it happens in a Catholic way and it happens in a Protestant way and it happens in a Native American way and it happens in a Jungian way. And all of those are slightly different metaphors, but they all help illuminate the central fact that we are all incredibly deeply loved by the divine spirit. That each one of us is loved in totality. So I think about the monk that goes on a picnic with a bunch of children and they're sitting out in the orchard and one of the children says to the monk, how is it that God answers my prayers? Because there's so many people in the world and so many people are suffering. Why would God have time to listen to, uh, to one little kid like me? And the monk says to him, look at this beautiful sun. The sun is the center of the universe. The whole solar system revolves around it. The biggest planets are held in place by the sun, which controls the movement of every body. And yet at the same time, and he picks up a grape and he says, the sun ripens this single grape with a total love as if it had nothing else to do. And to me, this is the perfect metaphor of the love of God. I go through the world and I feel that someone is in love with me. 
and it's kind of a secret. And I am charged with the responsibility of trying to figure out what that's about. And as an artist, I look around me and I see beauty everywhere. <laughs> and I think, what is the reason for that? <laughs> because as a, as a creator, I realize that the easiest way to create something is to make a factory, to, uh, to build a, a big machine that can just crank out results. And the cleaner and the, the cleaner it is, the more simplified it is, the uglier it is, the more efficient it is. But the fact is, when I'm creating something, if I put my heart and soul into it, it's going to be beautiful regardless. And beauty is, is a byproduct of my intention rather than uh, rather than the mechanics of, of making something. So although I can force my, my hand to pick up a brush and, and make a painting, the beauty does not come from the technique. It comes from the intention, the soul behind the technique. So I apply this principle to the, to the beautiful world around me. Why is it that in the fall, the leaves on the trees don't just turn brown and start to smell like everything else that dies. That would be the efficient way to make the leaves pass on. But instead they turn these marvelous colors, these eye popping colors that are absolutely useless. <laughs> the colors of the leaves don't do anything for us. They, they don't do th anything for anybody. It's absolutely superfluous. And to me, this is a signal that God is filling the world with beauty for my benefit. And I end up passing that benefit all on by means of making images. And to me, that is an expression of prayer. That's my responsibility, my, my uh, the response of my soul coming alive. And that coming alive is the subject of Easter. The dead things within us are revivified by the Eros that lives in the heart of each one of us, that separates each of us from a dead person. A dead person gets full of Eros and nothing happens. But a living person, as soon as Eros inflames their heart, they come alive in this remarkable way. And to me, that is the essence of Easter. So happy Easter, everybody. Nancy, I wonder if you want to add anything to that from your perspective. Well, I would like to add something, but first I am just drenched in the beauty of your words and the metaphors and the way you experience uh, God uh, and love and this idea of Easter. I mean, I, we could almost have a moment of silence uh, after what you have just said, Tim. It's been a worship service in itself. Well, thank you. Yeah, I concur. What I was thinking is on another side of this, and that is <clears throat> we had, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> we had a viewer on YouTube recently asking about the plague in the book of Exodus. And I've been thinking a lot about that story. I don't know how many know the story of uh, the Jews being set free in Egypt. I don't want to tell the whole story today. But basically, in order to be released from their slavery and captivity in Egypt, uh, God, through Moses, brought these plagues upon the Egyptians. 
And Pharaoh was so stubborn, and it says God hardened his heart, but he was so stubborn that one plague after another had to come to try to humble that man enough to let the people go. And I was thinking in my own experience, and this is just within the last week, um, I had a, a real heartache and I began to ponder that heartache. And what I wanted to do was to do a lot of blaming. <laughs> and uh, instead of that, during a prayer time, I realized that um, all, these, all these attitudes within myself were coming from a wounded ego. Uh, an ego that had to let go and let me live and let me be free. But it, it took a great heartache in order to break me loose and to see those wounded selves, to uh, extend compassion to those wounded selves so that they would quiet down and let me live in the deep center where the deep river of peace, contentment, love, and wholeness is within myself. So those plagues, I think there are things that come along in our lives that are trying to break us loose from those old wounded places to free us to be who we were born to be. And it feels to us very much like a plague within. It's terribly painful. Uh, we want to we want to give up, we want to get mad, we want to retaliate, we want to revenge, we want to turn our back on perhaps a person or a group. Uh, but then that very pain, if we are have our eyes open, uh, bring us to a place of resurrection where we do let go, where those wounded aspects do let go. And we are freer, we are transformed, but the plagues seem to be needed and the stubbornness of the ego seems to be a natural kind of thing. But in order to be freed from that, some pretty painful things have to happen. And so coming to this new awareness today of myself as uh, able to discern the wounded places now and the wounded selves within myself, to be able to discern them. And by grace and by a two by four across my head, uh, to let go and to be reborn into a new and larger self. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you, Nancy. I want to, uh, Skip, can you turn on my screen sharing? Uh, yes. I've got a, I don't know if this will work, but I've got a painting here. Let's see. Uh, just trying to figure out. Uh, hmm. So Nancy's talking about the, the value of that plague. And to me, that's what, that's one of the beauties of the coronavirus, is this um, this uh, two by four over the head business that we, no matter what our egos want, the reality is we have to we have to deal with the plague as it as it sweeps. Whoops, we lost him. Um. I have turned screen sharing on though. Uh, let's see. Here it is back. I'm sorry, I might have done that. Oh, good. I doubt you could have done that. Tim, uh, I have turned screen sharing on. There you are. Good. Cannot hear you though. Miles, it's in British Columbia at a place called Canal Flats. And- Oh, I know that, I know that spot well. You oh, were there you? and you painted that? Yes. Yes. And this to me is the feeling 
of uh, the 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 cold and the darkness coming to an end. Um, that sense of anticipation that is, I think, unique to people in our part of the world in the northern hemisphere, and I'm sure this is true in the southern hemisphere, that it's only in places that really have winter where the springtime has this kind of gripping effect on the soul because we've, we've suffered through so much cold and darkness for so many months. And, you know, the rivers uh, finally thaw and, and we see breakup and the rivers start pushing ice downstream and the birds return and the snow melts and the green comes up from the ground. Uh, here's, here's this just astonishing um, sense of renewal that I think people in the, in the middle part of the world just simply do not get to share in. This, this is one of my favorite times of year because the, uh, the participation in spring is so beautiful and so deeply felt. Do you agree with that, Miles? Yeah, and one of the things for everybody's uh, geographical knowledge, uh, Canal Flats is very close to what's called the Colum called Columbia Lake, and uh, the Columbia Lake is the headwater of the mighty Columbia River. You know, so it starts out from a place pretty pretty much. At, near this location um, and uh, those little streams coming together eventually after I don't know how many maybe a thousand miles it empties into the Pacific Ocean um, at, at the border between Washington State and Oregon so um, you know talking about life being created uh, resurrected in a sense it, it's very fitting this, this painting yeah, and uh, more a little bit more on that because my family is from upstate New York, where is one of the heaviest snowfall areas in the United States, um, and uh, perhaps Cynthia can resonate with this. My father used to say, um, "We used to have snowstorms in June," and my father used to say, "Winter isn't over until God has you on your knees." <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's almost like you're hibernating in the winter, kind of like the bear. And then in the springtime, you just wake up and it, everything's in bloom. It's just uh, you get that feeling of uh, life again, I think, is the way I look at it. It's really, you know, in the animals and it's just wonderful. So, yeah. Uh, some people don't have the season, so I wonder about them as to how do they react to that, like in California or something where they don't really have a season. Right. Well, I've got some, I've got to join my Easter choir, so I'm going to take off, but thank you, everybody. And happy Easter, and we'll see you in a few days. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy see you Easter. Soon. Thanks, Tim. Bye Sing. now. Thank Sing you. beautifully. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I'm going, I have a, a few things to share, but I'm, I'm going to save them for later. Uh, and uh, first, uh, let's, uh, Cynthia, do you have a special Easter story or an experience you've had with, uh, with Easter that's very meaningful to you? Oh, we got to unmute you. There, I've got you now. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> not specific to Easter, um, although maybe tangentially, is um, in the last couple of weeks, I've been going through boxes of letters between family members, um, going back to 
the uh, actually the 19th century, end of the 19th century, a vast reservoir of letters that my mother is trying to go through for a specific purpose. And um, it just has given me, first of all, an appreciation for how the tech that we use is, um, is doing the same thing that letter writing used to do. Not the exact same thing, but somewhat. Um, but it's also given me a sense more of the, um, the length of time that we have here. And um, it's just had me thinking about my, my ancestors and also extended family. And um, they, they were definitely very involved in the church so I'm sure that they all participated in Easter services and so forth but I didn't really grow up doing that very much but um, it's just been uh, it's been a way to slow down um, and take my mind off of the busyness of every day so that's all Well, that's uh, beautiful, and uh, we're definitely all getting this experience. Uh, Jerome, did you want to uh, give us some thoughts on Easter? Yeah, it took me 30 minutes for before my Zoom <laughs> decided to connect. So, I, And I looked up at the Zoom. Zoom's having a real spike in problems at 11 mm -hmm. o'clock, so... Anyway, that's that part of it. But yeah, the I guess churches all over the country that are trying to connect people up. Obviously, well, that's that's the next thing. Is uh, <clears throat> my Easter story is about uh, this whole week. Uh, I've been helping. Uh, I have a ninety-one-year-old neighbor who lives across the street. She's not technical or anything, but she always goes to church. Uh, and that's been her life, uh, you know, and enjoying that. And so I figured out that I could take my laptop over to her uh, house and and it my uh, router goes that far to see it. But so I've been watching these, uh, and this is particular uh, Lutheran church service, and I wasn't familiar with that before. And then so I've been watching these uh, and I, it's amazing to me that what I've discovered is that the they have rituals and symbology and uh, looking at it from a Jungian standpoint, these symbols are there uh, in everything that they do and their rituals and routines. And uh, uh, I mean, I was just uh, amazed that they're still there. I don't know how much they get from the symbolic aspect, but this is their discipline that they go through. And, you know, they're not uh, an experiential type of people that do this. They just follow these particular paths and structures. Uh, but it's uh, beautiful uh, services that they have and uh, the symbols and, uh, you know, I'm just amazed. So that's my Easter story. So I'm really learning a lot from that and really appreciate that aspect of it. And we can't really say for certain types of people, that's fine. I mean, that she just, uh, I mean, just such joy that she has and able to see that because she had not missed a Easter service or of uh, all the other things that lead up to that, the uh, poems and so forth. Uh, and uh, she did, she couldn't remember how long it's been since she's uh, ever missed a service uh, for that whole week. So, I mean, I was just, I was so glad I could do that, but I also learned quite a bit about the uh, symbolism and the structure and uh, it related it to my own I could see in the symbols they were alive. I don't know if they could. So that was my point. So anyway, that's my Easter story. So, Yeah, I think many people have 
don't really know why they do things, but they do them and, and they work. Uh, and that's the point of uh, all of the great religions. They provide a, a structure where you don't have to be a great intellectual to have the psychological benefit of, um, you know, a saving message in some way, whatever it is. <clears throat> and uh, obviously it's been misused in all faiths, but um, ultimately, if you look at all the world's great religions, they all do the, the same thing. Um, yeah, I was just surprised that it's it's a ritual, and they've got it all spelled out throughout the year, and uh, sure. uh, with uh, daily reading and uh, and, uh, and prayers. What, and, and Jung's point was that it affects us unconsciously, and yeah. we don't have to consciously know the way it works. I mean, what Jung did was he he uh, unpacked the way it works and talked about the processes that are at work and and what the religions are actually doing and of course he was like uh tim he, he was from generations of pastors and his father and seven of his uncles were swiss reformed pastors so um he unpacked for the rest of us how it works why it works how you can know how you can know this saving power that we're uh, ultimately talking about on Easter, which I'll talk about a little more in a minute. Um, yeah, and these, uh, the words that uh, the, the biblical readings and who are all structured, I mean, these are living, it's a living language. It's a living language if if it can be taught in a living way. Unfortunately, yeah, uh, in, my, in my personal experience in Christianity, uh, it was not taught in a living way, and uh, it wasn't until Debbie became a Buddhist, and and I started to go to Buddhist meditations that I became a better Christian. You know, when I, I my statement is, um, you know, Christianity was sort of leaving me cold, as it did uh, Dr. Young, who, you know, just felt nothing when he was confirmed in, in the Swiss Reformed Church, and I felt the same way. And But when I became a Buddhist, I became a better Christian. And when I became a Jungian, I became a better Buddhist and a better Christian. <laughs> yeah, I th yeah, I think that's true, because the more you learn about the different types of uh, religions like Buddhism and, you know, all the other isms, uh, you come to recognize uh, your roots are really Christian if you think about it, whether sure. you want to or not. And that's what Young was. Young was afraid of people going out and exploring these other religions, you know, like the Easterns, and people get attached to it. But I, your your point there is perfect because I did the same thing. You know, you you explore these and you realize that you know, come back home and deal with your own. Uh, upbringing and own culture and your 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 own uh, you know it is christian based and so that's he always said come back home and deal with that so right it, it's it's a great journey that uh, exciting but yeah uh so cindy uh, cindy i know from my buddhist meditation group uh and uh i'm very very pleased that she's uh gotten interested in what we're doing here. And uh, so, Cindy, I wonder if you have a story that's apropos for the moment. Well, again, thank you. And happy Easter and Tashi Dalik and all the greetings that we would say on a day like today. Every day is a good day. Um, but I... Uh, I don't know if it's an Easter story. I've got, you know, my life is kind of a story. Somebody was talking about that last night. <coughs> and it's funny because uh, I think it was Tim who was talking about, was it Tim? Um, about getting hit on the head by a two by four. That that actually happened to me yesterday. I don't know. <laughs> um, 
there's a story behind that, but I I also agree that my understanding. But Nancy actually, Nancy was telling us about that. Was it Nancy? <laughs> I, it, we had a we had a lot of wind a couple days ago, two days ago, um, and a panel of my my uh, garage door fell out, and so I had to lift it back up, and. There was a two by four standing right there, which normally holds it, but the winds, we had like 50, 60 mile an hour winds. And um, so I'm holding, I'm trying to push it up and I just didn't even look. And the two by four just hits me. And this is a, you know, a regular uh, 12 foot two by four. <laughs> but, you know, and I thought about that and I, I, I thought about, you know, what kind of reminders, what kind of, signals what kind of alerts do we have in our life to stay mindful <coughs> and had i been more mindful of my what i was doing maybe i wouldn't have been hit but, but um i just continued to do what i was doing but yeah i was i was raised catholic my my father was actually an altar boy in the greek orthodox romanian church and um I, uh, I grew up, you know, across the street from the church that we went to. And when we moved, it was only maybe two blocks away or around the corner from, you know, across the street. So it was never far. And um, so it was very deeply entrenched into um, Catholicism and Stations of the Cross and just, um, you know, everything that I'd learned about God then. and. I didn't realize until I was introduced to Christianity in the mid eighties that I saw that I felt that there was a difference to me. Um, the lights came on. It's like somebody turned the lights on and um, I, I just rem recall my very first day attending this uh, non-denominational Christian service. It was in Greenbelt. And um, I ended up staying with that church for a good 20, 25 years. And I still identify with some of the people and the pastor who's, you know, he, he's gotten to uh, be one of the, listed as one of the most 25 um, influential evangelicals i think he was like number 19 this was about 15 20 years ago but brian mclaren and uh i learned i learned about god uh and i say about i i learned about how god is in me is in in everything and um it was very different you know maybe a good part of the difference was that i was a child and when I, you know, was being raised in the Catholic Church and I didn't understand and I, you know, could speak the whole mass in Latin, um, but I couldn't really translate what the Latin was. Um, and, uh, you know, I have some memories of that. And, and um, but when I, when I um, considered myself that I was reborn, as a Christian, it's my, I, I feel like it, it came to life for me. Um, I felt like I was <coughs> not having to go to the large church um, to feel God, that I could feel it in my heart, in my home. I could see God in my children. I could see God in the environment and people and nature. Um, and in all the animals, and I really began to understand much, much more. And I, I'm thankful for my Catholic upbringings um, because it gave me perspective. Maybe had I not had that, I wouldn't have had such a profound experience being introduced to Christianity and a non-denominational Christianity at that. And so, um, and then... <laughs> Uh, it was, I think, in 1999, I had my cousin from Pennsylvania. He was visiting Maryland. 
And uh, my, his sister, Marie, she had been doing some genealogy work. And she learned that uh, my mother was Jewish. And, you know, there, so there's a whole new pathway there. Um, when they immigrated here, they, of course, changed their name. But I recall then, as a child, many, many, uh, there are many different ways that my mother, um, that were about her, are parallel to um, what I've seen in, in Jewish families that I've worked with as a nurse. Um, some of the foods that are cooked, my mother would make potato latkes and she'd call them potato pancakes. And just a lot of different foods um, that I didn't really ever see other Catholic families do. And <coughs> so I thought, okay, you know, that's, that's really an area that I have um, not put in a lot of research in because it wasn't much later I think if I go back to some of my childhood upbringing, my dad was in the military and we lived in Germany when I was in high school. And that's really the time when I was 12, 13, 14, where I feel that, you know, I guess in, in, in the Jewish culture, you have bat mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and you become of age. Well, I felt like that's where I became of age and I began to acknowledge and see the world around me and kind of where, where do I fit into that? And I think that that's where I was originally exposed to Eastern philosophies. I didn't, uh, of course, we didn't have the internet then. Um, I was reading Alan Watts, Be Here Now, and, um, you know, a, a variety of different writings from scholars and you know, when I came back to the United States in 70, was it 74, 74, um, of course there was no internet and I didn't recognize anything around me um, that resembled what it was I was being exposed to. So it was another type of philosophy slash uh, religion. I mean, I recall back then I had friends that were Muslim I had friends from um, Morocco, Pakistan, and so I had a whole mismatch of people with different belief systems. And we, I don't recall getting into real in-depth conversations, but I recall that there were conversations and points of view and perspective that were very different than anything I'd ever been exposed to. And so without the internet, I came back to the United States and I fit right back neatly into being a Catholic because that's what I was. And so when I was exposed to Christianity in the mid eighties, um, it was, it was a revelation for me. It was just awakening. It was just, wow, this is, it was just, I felt so alive. And, um, and then, you know, as I've, and I've raised my children as Christians, my, my daughter, um, she, uh, she's a bit more open-minded and my son is, um, and, and their schooling I think has made a difference. Um, my son attended a uh, Christian school from second grade on. And, um, uh, and so, but in the, I would say probably around the early two, uh, 2010s, shortly thereafter, I was exposed again to Buddhism. And it just sounded much like what I had been exposed to in the mid 70s when I was 12, 13, 14, 15. And that was kind of a longing. It just it made sense. It, as a Catholic and a Christian, I had many questions that, because, you know, being science minded, um, I was working in a hospital at the age of 12 well, when I first got there as part of work co-op. So I really became very critical thinking um, regarding what beliefs were. And I could see that that was like a, a collide um, of, you know, asking fact-based questions to belief-based 
ideologies and it was very difficult. But that's where it began to make more sense. And I think over the course of time, I have come to believe that there are many gods. Um, no God is, um, you know, I think each God is, it's in our heart, it's in our life, it's in us. It, it goes back to what I've come to understand about Christianity, that God is in everything. And it can be referred to um, in many ways by many different ideologies and religious um, perspectives. But for me today, you know, and I've got a lot of old Easter stories, you know, getting a lot of candy. I used to get upset stomachs a lot on Easter Sunday. You know, it's just the chocolate was just like, oh my gosh, I would overdose on chocolate. <laughs> I just, I recall sitting one time across the street from the church. I don't remember so much the inside of the house. But I remember the steps on the front of our house. And I remember thinking, oh, I can't take another bite of this bunny. I just, I, I can't do it. I wanted to do it because that's what I'm supposed to do. I must, must have been, I don't know, five or six or so, so, somewhere in there. And I just remember thinking, oh, it's just too much. But, you know, your, your brothers are around and your neighbors are around. So you're, you're, you're gnawing on the bunny ears just like everybody else. And, um, and so I, my stories of this day are a kaleidoscope of my experiences of what I've been exposed to in my life, where it brings me to where I am today. And I think that I have also felt and believe from the depths of my heart that all these things together with my exposure and my studying and practicing Buddhism in the, in the last part of my life today has made me a better Catholic, has made me a far, far better Christian, has made me a better person, has made me kind and thoughtful and forgiving. Probably forgiving is the biggest thing is um, I was never one to hold grudges, but I wouldn't forget. And now I forget. I forget misdeeds. And um, people owe me, you know, $5, $10, $50. I forget it. I, I, don't, I don't keep tabs of things. And um, when I was last in India, and I'm sorry, I'm talking so long. <laughs> It's kind of nice to talk without coughing. <laughs> um, when I was last traveling in India, we were in Ladakh, which is uh, way, way up northeast, very close. It's about 200 kilometers from, um, it's in the Jammu and Kashmir area, about 200 kilometers from China and maybe two, 300 from Afghanistan. And um, it's really controlled by, you know, a lot of police, a lot of military from all three countries, India, Afghanistan, and, you know, you see a bit of Chinese. But we went to Ladakh and there's um, a national park called Hemis National Park. And we, uh, our, our teacher, our, our Lama, uh, we call him Rinpoche, he led us through hiking up to the top of these peaks. It was about a three hour hike up and I had about 20 pounds on my back. Um, and one of the stories, and I, I think I shared this with our Monday group, is that you know there, there's some periods in the Bible where, where Jesus was lost, the lost years. And they're lost in the sense for the Catholic church that there's nothing documented during those years. But in all other parts of the Middle Eastern world and, and uh, lower Asia, Southeast Asia area and in India and Nepal and um, Afghanistan where Jesus traveled during those years. And so we, I got an opportunity as we hiked up this, uh, these mountains, um, to learn the story from our guide, who uh, is a native of Ladakh, and she spoke to us about um, the years that Jesus traveled through that area um, prior to his crucifixion. 
and it was during those lost years. And so for me, it was a, a coming together again of beliefs. It was something that um, when I went to India the first year, it was on my bucket list to kind of like, yeah, I want to do that. I want to go there. And um, so I'm really, really happy that I did. Um, there was a, a spring, a, a river, a spring that comes down from the river that was noted to be very blessed that over the centuries um, that many, many soldiers that were wounded in the wars would drag themselves to these springs because it was noted that these waters were holy waters. And so um, she showed us that area and I was able to, to get some of that water. And um, for me, it was a blessing. So my Easter stories, I'm sorry, I've gone on so long, but it's a culmination of my beliefs. And all my beliefs have helped me in other areas of um, religious perspectives. I wouldn't trade at all the early years of being Catholic. And I think that, um, you know, I, I, I kind of wish I would have learned more about Judaism, um, understanding that I guess I'm Jewish uh, by heritage, but I'm not um, schooled in that, in that way. And so my life's not over yet. <laughs> um, and I want to learn more about what's in the Quran. I think that all these religions offer hope. They offer kindness they offer a sense of who God is and, and God is in us. And so um, I'm just appreciative to be able to even think about this stuff right now. So thank you. Oh, that's great. Uh, you, you conjured up some memories for me is, uh, I don't know if you can see this. Yes. That's, that's V here now. Ah, Original coffee, so Ram Das, this put out okay. by the Hunamanum Foundation. Oh, yeah. Uh, Alan Watts was, I just recalled that the name of the book was called The Book. Yeah. I and think it was called The Book, but yeah. yeah. This had is that as here, well. be here now. And so it talks about Ram Das and his journey to India and uh, his guru and so forth. And so uh, I met Ram Das several times and uh, you know, he's, he definitely had an aura about him and was able to bring you to have a, a certain experience. And it was just uh, outstanding. But it's, it, it's also a taste. Uh, and so that's part of our goal here is we get little tastes along the way, hopefully, uh, and can experience that. Uh, but we don't want to, uh, our whole purpose is to develop that ourselves and real, have that realization. Uh, and because uh, I've seen a lot of followers of gurus and, uh, you know, they never get to that status because they get so attached to it mm -hmm. and addicted to the guru. So uh, the whole purpose of that is to give you a taste. That was my not. And I went around and tasted different things. And so that's, uh, I think that what you said and going around and doing that, that really helps uh, to put it together. At least that's my journey. So, and it sounds like it's very similar to yours. And uh, I see Fenelope's on here. She's had a similar journey, I believe, if she wants to talk. Don't hear. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Elsie, all right. Why don't, uh, Miles, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a Easter story if you have one? Oh, thank you. Um, well, there's a theme that I always find here that I don't find elsewhere. And when I say here, I'm, I'm thinking of all of those that come together uh, to, to reflect on what Carl Jung said in his collected works. So 
last night, or rather your previous uh, event of the global check-in, Joss read work by Joseph Campbell. <clears throat> and he said, at the time that he wrote that, some decades ago apparently, that we'll come to a point where we will respect um, all the nations, all the creation stories of the world. And a little bit of background for me, I've had mystical experiences with Jesus Christ. I call them mystical because I'm not entirely sure. Uh, some of them I would say were like getting a message from him that helped me make a significant decision. Um, other times when I was in church, just crying when I was listening. Excuse me. So it's it's very interesting because um, I'm, I'm I'm in in humility. I feel I am obligated to to take everything that people have shared. And you know, interesting that Jerome said, uh, you know, you you go forth and then you come back and Eaton Jerome said you have to deal with your own and um, what what that means to me uh, is is to um, actually um, do something to uh, to attend to the issues I have with uh, here in Canada uh, the what is called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report <clears throat> And it's interesting that Joss, she read, when I listened to the uh, words of Joseph Campbell that she recited, I actually had a dream last night. And I was in a, in a room with a lot of people, including First Nations. And I said, not only do their creation stories need to be respected, but they need to be embraced. And... Uh, and to put it into even more formal context, uh, reading from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that uh, Canada produced in 2015, I was drawn to attending to two calls to action. And uh, <clears throat> number 94, the first one is we call upon the government of Canada to replace the oath of citizenship with the following. I swear or affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors, and that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada, including treaties with indigenous peoples, and fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen. So the change in the oath is the addition of including treaties with indigenous peoples. Um, so that's the first call to action that I'm drawn to. Then the next one, which relates to what I was just saying, is call to action number 49. We call upon all religious denominations and faith groups who have not already done so to repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over indigenous lands and peoples, such as the doctrine of discovery and terra nullis. So, you know, it's a, a bit of background. Um, I've been through different Christian denominations 
and I've learned immense lessons from all of them. You know, and, and one of my early inspirations was Adrian Rogers, the late Adrian Rogers. Um, I uh, ended up being baptized in a Baptist church, and I was so, uh, and I still am, I, it's so, so hard to say that I'm not a Christian, and yet I'm sharing this, but I, I, I even in my, I don't know what sort of um, uh, illusion I had, but I even invited Charles Stanley to my baptism. I actually, it was actually an in international event. I invited people from Wyoming, um, uh, but, and and the, the event was still very, it still is very, a very mystical and important event in my life. And, and uh, the only thing in summary is I'll say that I'm, uh, I'm called to, to reach out and embrace First Nations creation stories. And I'm also, um, I'm also, as Jerome said, required to come back to Christianity and, as I think he said, deal with it. And that means um, I actually, the reason I say I'm not a Christian is because I'm now seeing, uh, I see the Bible uh, differently than any theologian has talked to me about it. I've, I have seen, I have passages that I would say that, for example, I think the Bible has a different message for men than women, significantly different. and. I think it's important for men to consider what I have to say with respect to that difference in interpretation. And, um, and uh, that, that uh, at the same time, I am not, I'm not diminishing the, the message of Jesus. So uh, that's, that's uh, I guess, my Easter message. And uh, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts or reflections for me. Appreciate you sharing that, uh, Miles. That's great. Uh, uh, the, the indigenous people, and uh, I, I went to some of the ceremonies, like the sweat lodge ceremony and so forth, and we went through the routine smoking the feast five and sitting in hot rocks getting hot <laughs> you know but you had the same experiences of uh, god as you have anywhere else uh you have that that it, it washes you down and you have that uh what i call just the the love comes out and everybody's just able to have a conversation with each other and understand and it's just it's wonderful it's beautiful uh, so, uh, you know, yeah, I, I just encourage people to go out and explore, but I've been an explorer, but I mean, you know, I'll encourage that. So, uh, uh, Penelope, do you, uh, do you want to say, uh, let me, let me, on, uh, hold on. I got to, uh, sorry, you can't hear me. There you go. Oh, okay. I've yeah. got a mix of things. Um, a mix. I'll start. I, I have to go out and get some water and I got something in my eye. I put all my makeup on and I went out and was feeling very bright and breezy and then I got something in my eye and I got really annoyed because I couldn't put my finger in my eye to get it out because we're not supposed to be putting our fingers in our eyes. So there was a bit of frustration in me that I had to walk for half an hour before I got home with this thing in my eye that was maybe a bit of whatever it was from the pollen and not being able, and the frustration, it felt very restrictive and this authority that's telling us that we can't touch our own body. <laughs> and that for me, um, I'm sort of very anti-authority, I think, because I came from such heinous abuse that, as a kid, that any authority, parent, um, 
religions that are that are restrictive of people or give people belief systems that there's a punishing God. I'm very strongly repulsed by any belief that God punishes people. I believe, I think I read something that Jung said about God, that, you know, God is, it, it's all of it. It's the, the good, the bad and the ugly. There's no, nothing's being done to us. I see God in flowers. Like I've, I've looked earlier on my phone. I've had from last year, I had about 300 pictures of flowers on my phone and through the summer. I, as I walk around randomly taking pictures of flowers. So for me, I see God in flowers, but I also see God in myself. So I don't see God as sort of something out there that's doing something, but it's a safety that just is just there. But I had lost a bit of faith sometimes, which I think is normal. We can go through days where we lose faith and then there's other days where we feel it strongly or have a numinous experience. And, um, and then there was that, and then I, was flagged on there's a TEDx on Bill Gates um, video going around. I won't get political because I'm not political, but there's a lot of smiles in a video suggesting that we um, had um, a that we ha all have a certificate to say whether we've got the antibodies or whether we've had the virus or not, and that disturbs me. Again, the idea that anybody can say that we have a, a vaccination would really frustrate me um, again it's my body and I'm not being restricted on this earth by any authority in my view so I've got at the same time um, I've had a family member the other thing that's gone on for me today which has been irritating because the having that virus for 28 days which we don't know if it was that but I will get a blood test in months to come to see if I did have that but I would say that 28 days I had that and from symptoms. And I think that um, I have a family member that I had to inform, I'm only in contact with them for a, a reason that shouldn't really have happened, but it's the case. And this person keeps texting me if I'm okay. And when they're texting me, it's putting me in a bit of fight flight because it's bringing up early memories. So I'm get, getting frustrated that I'm in this position where I can't just again, tell somebody to, take a run and jump at this point, but that's going to happen in due course. Sounds a bit harsh, but that's where I'm at. So whilst I'm full of love, I don't believe that, you know, again, I think any religious context where forgiveness is imposed upon people that have been through abuses, um, I, I'm very strongly against it with complex PTSD when working with people that, and spiritual communities that suggest that as a cure. I think that what I found is that as I've healed, when the pain ceases in places, you soften and then you become, it's not such a big issue. So it's not something, I don't think forgiveness is something that we do. It's something that will come to a, some sort of closure within ourselves as we go through life. And sometimes it won't. It depends on the situation and that's what we're working with within ourselves. But I'm, I think in the spiritual communities where I hear that as the number one cure, I think it's it's very hard on people that have been through deep, deep trauma. And even the idea that one has to forgive oneself, I can find offensive on occasion because in my view, when people have said that to me, I've never, I personally, I've not done anything to even forgiving myself for even having my feelings of not being forgiven. It's like, it's a circle. It's a spiral out of, so, but saying that, I do love Jesus. I call him in every night when I go to bed. I call in, I, I say, Jesus, Jesus, Archangel Michael and Archangel Gabriel be with me now. The reason I, and I say it out loud before I close my eyes. And the reason is, is the first 20 minutes of sleep, I see eyes face to face, like one after the other, like a face is coming. Some of them are very beautiful, extreme beauty. And some of them are very, they're, whatever realm it is, then they're not pleasant. And sometimes I've asked them in that sort of sleep consciousness, are you, you know, are you a spirit of light? And, and they disappear. They, and then another one will come in. So they're coming in like morphing in and morphing out. So I find that fascinating. So I do believe that Jesus is a protector. The way I see Jesus, I could see Jesus eye to eye. I feel not as somebody that's above 
above me. I see Jesus as being a very powerful archetype of power and truth. And he turned the tables. He didn't put up with, you know, nonsense. And I like what I understand about what Jesus is for me. That's, I've got something to, I've wrote, I posted something earlier, which I'd, um, somebody sent to me, which was the Psalm 91, which was really lovely. And about the safety of the abiding in the presence of God. So that was quite beautiful that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And quite beautiful, that psalm. So. Thank you very much, Penelope. Um, okay, I have uh, a little bit of a numinous story from Easter. And whenever I speak about numinosity in my own life, it uh, makes me very emotional, of course. So I'll apologize if I lose my composure. But um, over the last uh, 25 years, I have uh, worked very heavily with um, India and Southeast Asia and also with um, the Middle East. And uh, here in Annapolis, two miles from where I live right here, uh, is the chapel of the United States Naval Academy. I hope it's a panorama, so I'm not sure I can share it. I'm going to try. Okay, so uh, this is the, the front one-third of the chapel of the U.S. Naval Academy in panorama. So you can see from left to right from this point back, um, there are another 1,500 seats in pews, of course, and this is called the Cathedral of the Navy. So you can see that there's a cathedral arm here and a cathedral arm here, and then the, uh, and then the central uh, place where the pastor speaks and so on, the pulpit. And uh, it has a, quite a beautiful organ. Um, some people say this organ has 3,000 pipes. Uh, I, I have looked at it many times, and I, I think that they missed it by a factor of 10. It's actually perhaps 300 pipes, not 3,000. But anyway, it's quite an impressive organ. And on Easter Sunday, when they, um, they pull out all the stops, of course, and so the organ is in full bloom, and uh, there are always 2,000 people, which is the seating capacity in the chapel, except this year, of course, and, um, and they often invite a, a um, brass choir to come and also play pieces. And so um, I, I like to take visitors to the chapel, uh, especially on Easter Sunday, because it's such an impressive service and uh, they do serve communion. I, I attend the Protestant service, but an hour before, they just turn the cross around and, and have Jesus hanging on it, and, and they <laughs> run the, the Catholic service. Very practical. So the Protestant service has been very meaningful to me for a long while. And one year, I had uh, four of my Indian colleagues um, visiting. So I said, you know, we're going to have this service on Sunday, and I'd love to invite you uh, to the chapel uh, for the occasion. And uh, so they agreed, and they came, and we were seated in the pew, and the time came for taking communion. Now, this is about deprogramming our, our, ourselves from uh, religious dogma, because I've always been taught in the Protestant church that no one, you cannot take communion until you have had a confession of faith and you've been confirmed as a Christian. And so the time came for taking communion and you had to stand up at the pew and walk up to the communion station. There are several 
uh, stationed around the building on Easter Sunday. And uh, I got up and my four colleagues got up also. I turned to the one that was the leader of the four and I said, uh, you know, this, this part of the service is only for Christians, for, for confirmed Christians. And he said, we want to take the blessing. And I couldn't argue with that at all. And so we all went up and took the blessing. And it's, it's just a story about deprogramming ourselves from, um, you know, the teaching of our, our religions and, and the attitudes of our religions, because obviously there was no harm done to anybody by taking the blessing. And it taught me a valuable lesson. But anyway, I want to go a little bit deeper into this because I want to talk about the saving power. So I'm now going to share with you just the, the altar area of the chapel. And obviously here, this beautiful stained glass window is one of two that were done by Tiffany. And so you can see how wondrous his stained glass is compared to anyone else's. Um, and he was quite famous for these windows. But above the altar are these words. Eternal Father, strong to save. Now, this is, this is a reference to the saving power of, uh, of, that is within us all. But of course, it was always uh, taught to me in a, in a way that was outside of myself, father up there type thing. Um, but I, I never can talk about this without getting emotional because um, this is also the first five words of the Navy hymn, which is called Eternal Father. Uh, in, in civilian hymnals, it's called, or I guess in all hymnals, it's called Eternal Father, but uh, it's known as the Navy hymn. And uh, I've had, um, I've had many, uh, numinous experiences with this hymn and it's started when I was 10 years old and we were in the chapel at the Naval Air Station in Norfolk and uh, in Navy chapels this hymn is always sung in every service <laughs> And I just remember in um, when I was 10, how I was actually falling asleep in the service as I often do during church services because I realized now that I'm susceptible to hypnosis and I actually get hypnotized by um sermons and things, and it causes me to fall asleep very often. But I woke up for this hymn, and I just saw how much feeling people were putting into the, into the singing of the Navy hymn. And of course, even at that time, which was 1956 or so, um, the flyers who were flying out of Norfolk were flying uh, anti-submarine missions off the coast of the United States, and they were f making 12-hour uh, runs. And and some of them didn't come back. And so, uh, so that congregation 
really had a lot of skin in the game. Uh, but I want to mention that in this chapel and in every Navy, I assume in every Navy chapel, I haven't actually checked it, but it's certainly true in this chapel that on the placard where the, where the hymns are posted, um, you always find the number for the Navy hymn even when there is not a service going on. And that number is 808. And uh, the reason that that's significant, significant I'm going to share it with you here. Um, and it'll... I don't know, maybe only a union can work this out. But 808 represents um, a mandala at the center of the zero and two infinities representing the, the chaos or the sea in which we all sail. And so I wanted to just give you a, first reading of the um, hymn, uh, uh, the first verse, and then just a, a Jungian interpretation of it. Um, Eternal Father, strong to save, whose, whose arm hath bound the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep, its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. Now, if we go back and look at that from a union perspective, we would be talking about Eternal Father being that very deep unconscious part of us, the God image, the self that is within, within all of us, and we all have a sliver of the divine in us in, in that form. And so that part of us is very strong, and it does save us in our hour of need. And um, so whose arm doth... Uh, hath bound the restless wave, so, uh, and who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. So obviously in a, in a materialistic point of view, we're talking about the seashore, but in terms of our, our personal life, it's uh, the limits of being inundated by the chaos around us. And, uh, and so it, it is a power that rescues us in our hour of need. And uh, let's see. And then, oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. Well, we're all in peril on the sea of chaos around us. And our boat is very small. And um, so uh, that brings me back to the rescuing power. And yeah, just for just to confirm, the yeah. numbers eight representing uh, chaos, the seas of chaos, and yeah. the zero is the saving. Well, yeah, uh, the zero is the mandala. The, the mandala. zero. The zero is the symbol of the mandala, uh, and it's the symbol of God. Or, I mean, God the mandala is, or... yeah, the mandala is the symbol of God, and um, so it represents a mandala. And you know, I only came to that knowledge recently, but I mean, obviously, the the fact that the the number is always on the placard in the Navy Chapel uh, allows even visitors who are 
not um, not familiar with the Navy uh, because there are many tourists that come here to just visit the Naval Academy uh, and consider going to school here and so on. Um, it allows them to come through the chapel during a tour, for example, and pick up the hymnal and link up the actual words with what's over the altar in gold letters a foot high. Um, and that's, that's what they do. That's why they did it. Um, and it's referring to this rescuing power. So I want to come back now and share with you another thing, which <clears throat> uh, this is in um, Edward Edinger's book, The Christian Archetype. Okay, so this is uh, in the chapter entitled Gethsemane, and um, you can read it in part, but... Um, it goes over onto the next page, which I'm not giving you. Uh, so I, I want to read a passage here uh, that's in Edinger's book. He's, I'm starting at the first full paragraph. The source of inner strength constellated by prayer or active imagination is personified in Luke by the ministering angel, figure 15. Now, this image is a drawing and etching by uh, Rembrandt and the Christ, con Christ consoled by the angel. This state of affairs is described in the lines of Holder Holderland. Where danger is grows also the rescuing power. And that's from his poem entitled Patmos, P-A-T-M-O-S. And you may remember that um, it was John of Patmos who was the author of the book of Revelation, just for your knowledge. So, so if you find that, that poem online, it, you can find it's very meaningful. Or as Jung puts it, the highest and most decisive experience of all is to be alone with one's own self or whatever else one chooses to call the objectivity of the psyche. The patient must be alone if he is to find out what it is that supports him when he can no longer support himself. Only this experience can give him the indestructible foundation. That's from Psycholog Psychology and Alchemy, Collected Works 12, paragraph 32. Concerning the conflict between flesh and spirit, which occurs at Geth Gethsemane, Origen makes an interesting observation. Quote, of the passages in the Gospels which concern the soul of the Savior, it is noticeable that some refer to it under the name of soul and others under the name of spirit. When scripture wishes to indicate any suffering or trouble that affected him, it does so under the name soul, as when it says, now is my soul troubled, and my soul is sorrowful even unto death. And no, no one taketh my soul from me, but I lay it down of myself. On the other hand, he commends into father's hands not his soul, but his spirit. And when he says the flesh is weak, he does not say the soul is willing, but the spirit, from which it appears as if the soul were a kind of medium between the weak flesh and the willing suffering. The willing spirit, I'm sorry. So, um, in the, in the suffering of Gethsemane, the conflict between body and spirit is reconciled in the psyche, the medium that unites them. This is an extraction procedure. It, its product, the bloody sweat, and corresponding to the aqua permanence of the alchemist. So I'm, I'm going to stop at that point. But um, 
he would, um, as many of you know, the alchemists were really um, religionists who had to hide what they were doing for thousand, two thousand years almost, uh, or they would have been um, burned at the stake. But uh, so I, one other thing I wanted to share with you, since this is now the logo of uh, this group and uh, the wisdom path, this is um, this is Tim Holmes's drawing of the rescuing age and, and the salvation that comes. And uh, so going back to Jung for a minute, because this is all relevant to the psyche. Um, and uh, anyway, to, I'm sorry, Tim isn't here to share this since he is the, the person who created it. But um, he's also the person whose idea it is to do these meetings. So. Um, so from uh, Answer to Job, um, paragraph 752, um, it does not matter at all that a physically impossible fact is asserted because all religious assertions are physical impossibilities. If they were not so, they would, as I said earlier, necessarily be treated in the textbooks of natural science. But religious statements, without exception, have to do with the reality of the psyche and not with the reality of the physis, meaning the physical world. And uh, it was when I read that passage that I um, finally grokked it <laughs> and understood Dr. Young's message. Is that 752? Did you say seven? It's in paragraph 752, and it's, uh, it's halfway down in the, in the paragraph. As you probably know, Dr. Jung um, considered a paragraph as a psychic fact, one psychic fact. And so some of his paragraphs are two and a half or three pages long. And the reason for that is because he wanted to get all the elements of the psychic fact into what he was saying. So uh, if you look at the collected works, uh, they all have paragraph numbers. And the reason they do is because there are many different printed versions of the collected works of C.G. Young, but what they have in common is the paragraph numbers. So, um, whether they're in German or French or what language, uh, they all refer to the same place in the book so you can find it because the page numbers would be hopelessly different, but, but the paragraph numbers are the same. So you can always find where it is. And that the paragraphs starting with uh, seven, these particular paragraph numbers, by the way, relate to uh, the paragraphs in the collected works of C.G. Young, um, and um, yeah, in the in the collected works of C.G. Young, and um, so this is volume eleven. So answer to Job. Uh, let's see, there it is. Answer to Job is. Um, is extracted from the collected works. And so the, it begins with paragraph uh, 553 and ends with paragraph 758. That's the answer to Job. And uh, it's really one of the most profound things that he ever wrote. Um, but especially um, if you want to cut to the chase, read paragraphs 745 to 758, that's the last uh, 12 or 13 paragraphs. And um, you can find uh, volume 11 of the collected works called Psychology and Religion um, in the Dropbox. I think Answer to Job is also there separate 
separately, but certainly volume 11 is there. So you can go into volume 11 and um, find, uh, find those paragraphs and you'll have answer to Joe. Um, and, uh, well, so. he was, he was able to raise up the, uh, the words and, <laughs> and put them together, um, uh, that from the everyday up to the eternal, yes. and what you just demonstrated with the, the Navy song is the same thing is it was interesting that the title has eternal in it. Right. And so anytime you run into a writing, he's, they're raising this up from the everyday vernacular and it raises up to the eternal and it stands on its own two feet after that. And, it's right. just and we're, we're starting to see this right now with the coronavirus because each of us is reacting to the situation in our own ways. And, and that's our personal God image that is reacting to it and it comes from our unconscious individually but then um, the collective unconscious which is literally everyone in the world and perhaps this is the most collective of all collective unconscious events that has ever happened to the human species is happening right now and so our entire species is reacting uh, at an unconscious level in ways that we can't even predict. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of it is good and some of it is bad. And, um, but I know, because I, kn I know, like Dr. Young, that um, the rescuing power is there, not only in a, each of us, but it's also in the collective. And so that collective power, which is rightfully called God, um, and is, has always been called, has always been called God, um, although people didn't quite get what it meant, but that power is, is there and it's magnificent and enormous. Um, and this is perhaps the, the biggest demonstration of it that has ever been. And so it's interesting that it should fall and cause me to tell this story on Easter. Uh, yeah, yeah, Young's uh, over his house. He said, uh, called or not, called god is present you know absolutely. we're always present so absolutely you can and either uh i mean you can experience it as always being present or you can call it uh, right so you know that's a beautiful thanks Gil. right and the image behind me for those who don't know this is um the house that dr young built with his bare hands it's called bollingen and he never put electricity or plumbing in it. Um, and he said at one point that if, if a medieval man were to come to Bollingen and stay at his home uh, in that house, um, the only thing that would be out of place to that person was the matches. Everything else would have been... Um, just as a medieval man would have expected in the 16th century. Um, and there was a reason, a very important reason why he did it that way. And um, first of all, he said it's a, it was his confession of faith to build this house. And he, he did it in four year cycles over a period of uh, 16 years. So there was a quaternity there. And so think of this quaternity, okay. Um, and, um, and he did it when his unconscious told him it was time to build the next section. And, um, and the point was that he wanted to have 
um, the natural experience, the instinctual experience of earlier human beings that was not overlaid by thousands of layers of abstraction. And of course, um, you know, where in terms of what I was saying earlier, the abstraction uh, of, oh, you can't take the communion because you're, you haven't confessed life as your savior, or Christ as your savior. Well, you know, that's an abstraction and it's a, it's a dogma, but it, it's not actually true. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's not, not correct to deny somebody a blessing because they haven't uh, confessed Christ as their savior, just not at all. And, uh, and that hurts you in terms of uh, how you took it, you know, maybe other people wouldn't, but they don't realize the impact that we have when we say something to someone in terms of uh, uh, to give them, you know, to understand it. They didn't explain why, because you, you need to know why uh, yeah. something and they don't you, you don't just take, or i don't just accept a rule i have to know why and figure yeah. it out and uh, i no explanation given and i think that uh now you know what the explanation is but uh, i see your point so right um uh, i'd like to just add there will be people who listen to what we've been saying and sharing and they they will be of the opinion that oh you're diminishing jesus christ yeah i think all. we all we all agree that no it's the opposite we i i feel everything i've said and people can listen to it again if they want you know might have been controversial but i in my heart believe uh, i'm actually uh, raising elevating the message of jesus even when i say i'm not a christian and that's only because for me to go into so much detail as to where that's coming from, you know, it would uh, take too long. So, but anyway, I just wanted to say that, you know, there will be people who will be listening to what is being said and saying, oh, well, that's blasphemous, you know, and such things. And so well, it's really... I, actually, it's not. It's actually explaining what, what the meaning of these messages is, because what happened after the enlightenment was layer after layer after layer after layer of uh, the scientific method got overlaid over our religions and forced us into a um, imbalanced position toward the logos okay and so this is why pastors are always saying john 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Okay. Well, that's logos. And they just lay out the word and the rules and they abstract and abstract and abstract and abstract, and you lose track of where it is. So it's quite natural. I mean, this is why Friedrich Nietzsche said God is dead at the end of the 19th century, because many very rational men and most men have this have this bent toward logos um say wait a minute there's no god up there you know we can now we can see back to the big bang and there's no god there and there's no hell down there yeah there's there's uh hot lava but there's no devil down there the, there's no uh, suffering souls underneath the ground here and and they're right okay from a logos point of view that's correct and that's the point of dr young what dr young said in paragraph 752 um you know from from a physical world point of view that's true but as jesus said my kingdom is not of this world Okay, that is the point, and it it's of an it, it's a, of God's world, and when you find that place in yourself, then you'll be saved. Um, that's what saves you when you find that place, and you find that place when you when you find the rescuing power. When 
uh, you experience trauma, and this is what union analysts are doing all the time. They're dealing with people who are in trauma, um, and complex PTSD, as Penelope talks about often. Um, they're dealing with people who are in trauma, who are, are like this black smudge at the end of this image, at the bottom of this image, and they need the rescuing power to pull them out of it. And, um, and that re rescuing power comes in the form of something. If you're Christian, maybe you will say it's a, the rescuing angel, and that's why I've adopted this for our lo uh, logo. Um, but well, you, can do it, you can do it through prayer. Yeah, you can do it through prayer. You can do it, uh, you know, all, all the great religions do it uh, in different ways. And, um, and they're all right. Okay, so I can say, okay, here's the Bible. Um, and it's 100% correct. I agree with that. It's true, every word of it. Um, but there are words of it that are historical, that are a, a history, a history book, and that's a story of the physical world, and there are stories that are spiritual, and those are of the, of the psyche, they're not of the physical world. And you can say the same thing about the Quran, uh, which, by the way, contains all of the basic Christian stories are in the Quran. I, maybe you don't know that, but Christ is considered a prophet in the, in the Quran, and a very large percentage of it is, is actually devoted to the story of Christ. Um, and uh, the same is true of the Bhagavad Gita, and uh, the same is true of all, all religious texts. Uh, they all get you to that place, which is the rescuing power, however you want to talk about it. So, I don't know. Um, Cynthia is our, our newest visitor. You, you look shell-shocked. <laughs> Cynthia, how are you doing? Uh, sorry, we have to unmute oh, you. Sorry, uh, what I was trying to say was, um, I started to feel my eyes starting to droop, mm -hmm. and I thought, has he hypnotized me? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> That's what happens. I, it happens to me all the time. I it just happens. got drowsy, and I was just listening and thinking, and all the different levels, you know, the, the everything from the... Um, the, the physical to the metaphysical and I I just was being sort of uh, drowsy, made drowsy, I guess. Yeah. It happens to me all the time because um, Dr. Young is talking about things which um, are sometimes complicated to get your mind around because it's, it's something like, you know, I've been I've taken as an article of faith until that incident at the chapel that, um, you know, nobody can take communion unless you've accepted Christ as your Lord, right? And so I've accepted that as a given all my life. And then when my uh, colleague says, we want to take the blessing, how can I deny that, right? But that's, in a sense, it's shocking. And so what Dr. Young, um, is doing in these psychic facts and his books, he each paragraph is a psychic fact, and and basically a lot of things that you may have thought in the past are being somewhat challenged. And you know what is hypnosis? How do you do an induction in hypnosis? You confuse the mind of the of the subject so that uh, you know, you say, think about that and think about that and think about that and think about that. And pretty soon you can't think at all anymore. And then they can drop an idea into your head. And, you know, I'm, I'm not intentionally trying to hypnotize you, but I know when I'm reading anything that's Jungian, if I am, 
reading for the channel where I'm actually reading one of his books, many times and several times when I was reading Answer to Job, I literally fell asleep while I was reading out loud for the purpose of a video. I literally fell asleep. And, and yeah, you don't you, you don't have to read it like a book because I would do the same thing. I would, I would read along and then I'd have to go and meditate. Yeah, you know, that's and then think about it. But that what you're saying, Skiff, is we grasp onto these words and ideas and the idea is to let go of those because a lot of times when people say something if you're grasped to that idea and thought you think you know what it means yeah and you don't pay any attention to it so the whole thing is to try to ungrasp some of your beliefs about a system uh and and walk it through it's really a gestalt is what it is is what he's doing so i suppose can i ask a question skip sure what do you mean by psychic fact? What does that mean for somebody who... It's a fact in your psyche. You can't okay. touch it. Okay. You can't so. touch it, but there are psychic facts that are within us that you can't touch, but, you know... Um... I get it. I just wondered what it meant when you said it in that way, about yeah. his paragraphs. I mean... Now I understand it. it, it, it I could, I could say this, Penelope, why are you here, okay? Well, if, if you were, you know, you've known me for maybe a year and a half now, and, um, and if I pressed you to explain to me why you are here right now, um, it would be very difficult, okay? You couldn't, using logos, explain it. But nonetheless, it's a psychic fact, and you've sat here for now uh, almost two hours in this discussion, and we're doing this four times a week right now. And, uh, you know, people are coming to this meeting and people are watching it. You know, we've had several hundred people watching these me meetings now on the YouTube channel. Um, they are you know, there's a reason why they come, but it's not something that I can just say, whoop, there it is, that's why, um, you know, and you couldn't say it either. I mean, I, I was thinking about uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the famous uh, popular astronomer who, uh, he and Carl Sagan really dissed the psyche, okay, the two of them did. I mean, they were total logos guys. And, and Carl Sagan, the last book that he wrote in his lifetime uh, was, you know, against everything that is the psyche, basically. He was, he was really uh, going on about it. I mean, it was a real sermon against the Eros, the psyche. And um, in, you can see it in his last interview. You just type in last interview, Carl Sagan, and what he says be, right before he dies when he's facing death himself. And, um, yeah, and so Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, wanted to study under Sagan, and he went to Cornell where Sagan was teaching. And he described, he, he's given a description of the first time he came to Carl Sagan's door and he saw the name Carl Sagan on the door. And, you know, he, he sort of sloughs it off in like 30 seconds of his interview. But if you asked him to write down what that moment, that numinous moment, meant to him in his life um he couldn't he couldn't write it down in a shelf full of books okay that specific numinous moment and that is a psychic fact and it cannot be written about i mean it can be written about but you can only talk around it you can't actually give you this the experience and you know, and Dr. Jung knew that and knew that even though he did write a shelf full of books, that um, it's, 
you that have to have the experience. If you haven't had the experience, you're not going to grok it. You don't. You won't get it. And and uh, yeah. And when you have the experience, it's not what you expected. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's not so the definitions. It's not. You can talk for years and until you have. I, I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead, Cindy. So a psychic experience is it? It's not just a, like a memory. Well, it, it can be a very memory. Sure, it's a memory. Vivid. Your memory. Would it be implicit? Would it be like well, a little bit between implicit? a psychic experience? Well, let's put it this way. What I find is the things that I remember in my lifetime are pretty much all numinous at some level. Okay. In other words, if I can remember something when I was uh, two and a half years old, and I do remember a few things, they were all they all involved trauma or some sort of numinous event. If I go back and look at it, and um, you know, things are stored at different levels, and you've seen me already in this session. Uh, react to my own story about about the chapel and the Navy hymn, but um, you know the, these things are parked at different levels inside your psyche, and they only come up. And I don't. I only react emotionally when I try to talk about the Navy hymn. I mean, I I can't even say the first five words without uh, getting emotional about it because my whole life has been in the Navy. I mean, I put my life on the line in Vietnam based on that hymn. And, um, and I spent 23 years doing it. And so, uh, so that, you know, that's a totally numinous set of words for me. Okay. It's, it's beyond holy. It's, it, it's just so deep and I couldn't possibly, I mean, you've got a little sense of what I think about it, but I couldn't possibly, you know, with a shelf of books really describe what, what is going on with me with that hymn for my whole lifetime. And um, so those are all in the psyche at different levels. And so we have a kind of a, let's say we have a national memory and we have a, uh, and other, every country has its own national memory, and that's within the collective unconscious of that, that uh, country. But now we're having a humanity-wide, species-wide experience at exactly the same time, okay? It's not just Pearl Harbor 9-11. This is an experience that every human being in the world is going to relate to. And everybody that's alive today that's conscious, so you know, more than three or four years old, um, is going to relate back to this moment and have experiences to describe to their children about this moment uh, in, our, in the history of our species. And, but we all have those. I mean, you know, if, and so, as I said, I've seen 3,000 movies or 4,000 maybe. And when something happens to me, it'll, it'll trigger something in my psyche that comes up and it reminds me about what the lesson was in that movie. And I can literally re re recite dialogue from that movie, from the moment, the appropriate moment from that movie, um, I can recite the dialogue. And um, I used to, when I was in Japan, I had to write a, a monthly report to my headquarters every, every month, obviously. And depending on my mood, uh, I would turn on one of two movies to set my mood right while I was doing the writing. The two movies were um, Gandhi, and the other movie was Patton. <laughs> and and uh, 
So depending on my mood, I would be watching one or the other of those movies. I probably have watched both of them uh, more than 50 times, maybe 100 times. And so I literally can recite the dialogue of those movies uh, almost word for word. And, um, but I mean, it happens with many things. I mean, something will happen in my life and boom, it'll bring to mind something that I saw in a movie or some dialogue. And that's how we learn. That's our education technique today. We can't, it's very hard to learn from books, right? Um, you have to learn by experience. And, and Jung said, you know, you're, you're not going to learn anything from a psychological perspective unless you've had the experience. And that's why he didn't much want to deal with people under 35 because um, they're just, people under 35 are still learning how to be a human being. And it's only when when you come to your midlife crisis uh, and face the fact of your mortality that you have to look to yourself. And that's when a lot of people have trauma. The midlife crisis is a trauma because, you know, you believe, um, you know, everything is by these rules, boom, 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 boom. And, you know, I certainly did serving in the Marine Corps where everything's rules, right? And they have to be followed very precisely. But, and so I was always doing that, believing I was, I was protecting the rule of law in the United States. I'm an attorney, so I sh should practice the, you know, defend the rule of law. And so what do I find? Uh, 12 years ago, I started to realize that the rule of law doesn't really apply to people like me, okay? That I found out that the financial industry could harvest our life savings. And we found with our new president that you can just ignore the rule of law and get away with it. And uh, that's, that's an issue. <laughs> that's a big issue for me because I have been, you know, I swore an oath to it. I put my life on the line for it. I took that oath seven times in my career and I'm still bound by it. And he took the same oath and isn't bound by it. And if we aren't bound by our oaths, then what are we worth? Sorry, Skip. I mean, one that came to mind when you said that, like the early, I was brought up as Catholic and that honor thy mother and father. I mean, to, for me to fully understand that and then be able to help others with the, with what that means, you know, to me, that's bigger, like father, sky, mother, earth. It's like honor, I'm, you know, it depends how we, we look at words and then so that we're not punishing ourselves to, because we're all vessels. So we're all giving something and there's no ownership. It's a very funny thing being human because we're sort of held to sort, some sort of ransom that, parents or somebody there's ownership of some sort and i think god is much bigger than that and we've all got to come in somehow i don't know why that went but it just came so to I, me. yeah so i just like to ask folks to wrap this up a bit now and give you all a chance to do but i need to be out of here by 1 30 uh, because i have an obligation in my household to uh, recognize our Easter dinner and my wife and mother-in-law. So uh, let's let's each take a take a shot at it. Penelope, you're in my upper left corner. So uh, you want to wrap up anything you want to say yeah. or question for today? We can continue on 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 Monday and Tuesday. But I think I was gonna I was thinking something, but I can't recall what it was so it couldn't couldn't be that important but I think that um I think a lot that I've got nothing to say right now <laughs> I've got nothing to say right now okay drum I have nothing to say right now <laughs> okay Nancy. I thank you for sharing that but uh no this has been nice and I think uh you know, hopefully we can 
glean from each other and understand that we understand different things differently. Right. And we have to be careful when we... We, we have a surprise guest coming in here. Oh, we uh, do? Who's yeah. that? Kushpu. Oh, just in yeah. time, huh? Yay. Yeah. So, so Nancy, uh, any final thoughts? Thank well, you for coming, been, Kushboob. <laughs> this has just been wonderful for me because the monastery is closed at this time and they don't have digital meetings or anything. Oh. So I felt quite bereft. So this has been a wonderful service for me. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. Cynthia, any last thoughts for today? Go. I just want to thank everybody. And um, I have, you have all given me a lot to think about. So I don't have anything, anything to feed back right now, but I just know that it's going to be percolating for a while. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's been percolating in my psyche for 33 years. So I'm sympathetic. I mean, it, it doesn't get, Go, it doesn't go away, but it, mm -hmm. it can be, uh, you know, it, it can affect you in a very deep way once you understand what's being talked about here. Yeah. Um, Miles. Well, thanks again, Skip. And I think, you know, what we see is everyone has their unique individuation experience that their a journey that they're on and in, in our own context. So I shared some things that fit my context where I live. And it's a psychic fact that something is pulling me to, to address or do something with respect to the trauma of the land that I'm on and the, the trauma done to people here, the First Nations, and and to to you know be bold and say, well, this is what the numinous is drawing me to. These are psychic facts for me, and I want to share them. Um, as you said, Jung asked everybody, you know, is there something that you have to say? Everybody has a unique experience to share and it it's something worthwhile very very potentially very worthwhile for everybody to hear so whether you're in canada the united states or india um and other places in the world represented here you know it's uh, there is this there is this love that we're sharing and uh, that's what we have to get back to and, as you said, it's, it's very connected to the arrows. And these are concepts that were, you know, somewhere in, the, in my unconscious, I knew there's something not quite right. Um, and, and it's when people share <coughs> words like you have and the work of Carl Jung, and then everybody also with their own individual creation stories, we're all being pulled to a better world. Um, but you know, it's it's a matter of not just being passive. There's there's a requirement for action, and I must say that my experience with Christianity was, oh yeah, this is really comfortable. You know, it's all about Jesus, and He paid for all our sins, and you know, I'm I'm saved kind of attitude. Um, the Protestants will some of them say, well, there's no work to be done. It's all because of the work of Jesus, the finished work. And indeed, he said it is finished. But that's not saying that we're to be passive about it. You know, I think the yoke is light. It's just well, his, his, work, his, his work was finished in his lifetime, um, but it didn't mean that his spirit didn't, isn't immortal and it hasn't come down to us today until today. Um, so Kushbu, I will Thank come you. back. I will come back to you in a minute. You're our twice, 
two, two meetings a day girl because she was up at 7.30 in this morning to, to do our session from last night. And I'll come back to you in a moment. You're going to have to uh, watch this whole session because you basically missed all the juicy stuff. But uh, let me go to Cindy first. Sure, and sure, we'll come back sure. To don't you. worry. Okay, so Cindy, um, any last thoughts here? Wait a minute. Wait, we're not hearing you. Okay, now what? Oh. Okay, am I? Yeah. Am I on? Okay. Yeah. Um, I lost a uh, internet connection a few minutes ago, so I had to change rooms. But um, this has been a really good session. It's really um, given me a lot to think about, and I definitely want to go back and re-listen to it. <coughs> But one thing that strikes me because, you know, today being Easter Sunday and this being Easter weekend, um, when I think of, you know, whatever beliefs people have, there was a man, a human man that was facing his death and he knew that in advance. And he, he knew that it would cause pain for him, but more so pain for all his followers. And he accepted that. And I think, I think as we go through life, we walk into situations that are joyful, that are neutral, and some others that are maybe painful and dark. And I, I try to, you know, take a lesson from what he did. Um, and, you know, he died with great compassion for those that brought his life to an end. Great compassion. And, you know, I know I talked about forgiveness earlier, but I, I don't, I don't think it's really forgiveness. I think it's more of a sense of compassion. I have situations in my own life where I, I have compassion for um, the people and the situations, and that allows me to grow from it, to be able to take a situation that is very negative or dark, much like what Jesus did, and to turn it into something um, joyous and miraculous and growth within myself. And so that's my lesson from this weekend. And, um, um, but I'm waiting to hear from everybody else as well. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy. Okay. Kushbu. Um, I'm, I, I'm honored that you have come, uh, even though you, you've missed all the good stuff uh, because you were here last night So for us. So you, this is your second time with us in the same day <laughs> for you. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. You were here early in the morning, and then now it's late at night at uh, your time. And um, so... Um, I, what I can do is just ask you to uh, give us your blessing. And um, then uh, when I, I'm going to have to post this uh, video later because I wasn't able to get onto YouTube today. So I'll be posting oh. it, uh, later today and uh, then you'll be able to watch it. Um, but, um, and I will, I will send an email around to the people who participated today so that you'll know when it's posted. Um, but if, if you would, could, could you give us your blessing today? Sure, sure. And just, I, I just don't want to laugh. Add, add to what, what Cynthia said. Um, today was a very peculiar day. I, I have been, I have been listening to Bishop and, um, I have been I have been pondering upon last words of Jesus, and um, and yeah, like to real to really care. What does it mean to really love? To, so that is something I 
yeah i'm i'm letting jesus teach me that um that's what i can say for today and um, okay let's get into the prayer <sighs> thank you so much everybody to everyone. Happy Easter. Uh, well, we'll be back. Uh, well, the regular reading group, the regular reading group meeting is tomorrow at 8 p.m. Monday, and we'll have a, another group check-in meeting on uh, Tuesday morning, our time. Tuesday morning, my time at 11 a.m. So, okay. Uh, for yeah. Nancy, for Nancy, unfortunately, that's eight a.m. For you, it's uh, six thirty p.m. Uh, no, it's uh, eight thirty p.m. Eight thirty. Eight thirty. And Miles, you're in Mountain Time, are you? So for Miles, it's uh, nine a.m. And I'm for and for Penelope, it's uh, four p.m. Okay, for London. 4 wow. So wow. anyway, thank you all for being here today and happy Easter. Okay. God bless you. Bye. Peace. Bye. Bye, Nancy.